Excellent. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's a beautiful day in Albuquerque. I'm here at my home office in Victory Hills. My name's Amanda. I'm the Events and Marketing Director for Bookworks, your longtime Albuquerque independent bookstore. We are very pleased to be back with our event partner, Valerie Martinez from the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Thank you, Valerie, for helping us facilitate our event today. And we're super excited to be with Craig Harris, author of the new UNM Press book called Crossing Borders. And the subject of that book, Mr. Max Baca. Hello, Max. Hello, Craig. Thanks for Hello. being here today. I'm really excited to hear more about the music and the book. Let me tell you a little bit more about bookwork stuff while we're letting people in and getting adjusted. If you have a question during the event, you can type that into the chat. Also, let us know where you are, where you're tuning in from today. I know Max is down in Tejas. Valerie is in Albuquerque. And Craig Harris is joining us from Massachusetts. Massachusetts. All right. So we've got folks coming from all over the country today to talk about this new book, UNM Press book, Crossing Borders, My Journey in Music. Max Baca, of course, the front man of Love's Tex Maniacs. We are very excited to talk about the band today. And I know Craig has a video for us. So we'll do some chatting with them. If you have questions, put them in the chat for later on. Valerie, thank you for joining us today from the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Thank you all again for being here. If you're just tuning in, I'm Amanda from Bookworks, your 36 year old independent bookstore. <laughs> Here we go. We've got Craig's video. All right, folks. <laughs> For that, Craig. Uh, that's Max and the Boys, Los Tex Maniacs. What, what a great group they are! Exciting, um, energetic, very eclectic. Uh, as you'll see later on, that their repertoire is very diverse. And Max, as a bajo sexto player, is completely revolutionizing that instrument and pushing it into a whole new dimension. So, uh, so Absolutely. So we're so glad to have you. So everybody, my name is Valerie Martinez and I am the Director of History and Literary Arts at the National Hispanic Cultural Center here in Albuquerque. I'm going to introduce Craig and Max more formally um, in just a moment before we talk about the book and about the music, music that is so close to my heart, music that I grew up with here in New Mexico. But I want to give a big, uh, first, I want to give a big thanks to Bookworks and to the UNM Press for collaborating with us at the National Hispanic Cultural Center for this event and a series of book events since the fall of 2020. The National Hispanic Cultural Center is dedicated to the preservation, promotion, and advancement of Hispanic culture, arts, and humanities, including the literary arts. It's our pleasure to host events that celebrate books by an and or about the Hispanic, Latinx, Chicanx, Nuevo Mexicano, whatever word you want to use, experience 
Of course, music is at the heart of culture, history, and heritage. And so we're here today to celebrate the remarkable legacy of Max Baca. I want to thank UNM Press, uh, Bryce Emily from UNM Press. He's out of town this weekend. He's usually with us. Um, and he usually says a few words at this point. So I just want to give a shout out to UNM Press um, for the great work that they do. So let's get started and let me do some formal introductions of Max and Craig. Max Baca is one of the foremost artists of Tex-Mex music, the infectious dance music sweeping through the Texas Mexico borderland since the 1940s. His Grammy winning group Los Tex Maniacs and his extensive work with the accordionist Flaco Jimenez established the Albuquerque born and San Antonio based Bajo Sexto player band leader as a spokesperson for a too often malign culture. Max and Flaco recorded together and were members of, Tex of the Tex-Mex supergroup, the Texas Tornadoes. They appeared in concert with Selena and recorded with the Rolling Stones. The list of artists who have contributed to Los Tex Maniacs albums include Alejandro Escovedo, Joe Eli, Rick Trevino, Ray Benson of Asleep at the Wheel, David Hidalgo, Cesar Rosas, Steve Berlin of Los Lobos, and Lyle Lovett. Music historian, educator, storyteller, percussionist, and bluegrass country radio host Craig Harris is the author of Crossing Borders, My Journey in Music, the memoir about Max that is our focus today, as well as Bluegrass, Newgrass, Old Time and Americana Music, 2018, the band Pioneers of Americana Music, 2014-2017, Heartbeat, Warble, and the Electric Powwow, American Indian Music, 2016, and the New Folk Music, 1993. In addition to playing percussion as a guest of C.J. Chenier, Greg Brown, Jonathan Edwards, Rod McDonald, Melanie, Merle Saunders, Rick, Rick Danko from the band, and Los Tex Maniacs, he is a member of the Gaya Star Band with whom he's co-hosted the syndicated Gaia Crystal Radio Hour since 2014 and two day jeans. After teaching music in public charter schools for more than a quarter of a century, Craig launched the Drum Away the Blues program in 2009. Since then, he's presented multimedia programs on indigenous music, America's musical roots, Woodstock's 50th anniversary and rock and roll in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Florida. And I dare you all to mention whichever state was not included in that list. So let's give them a warm welcome, um, Craig and Max, and uh, we'll just start the conversation. Thank you, thank you. So I guess I just want to start um, for both of you about where, you know, where this book started, um, where the idea came from, and then maybe a little bit about how the two of you collaborated together to create it. Uh, well, well we... I think, I think um, uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, hello. Thank you, uh, Valerie and uh, Craig. It's good to, be, uh, good to be here. It's good to be anywhere after after what I went through back in November, you know, I survived the, the uh, COVID. I was in the ho I was hospitalized, but uh, we'll get to that later. Um, but to answer your question, uh, Craig is, is a super gentleman. Um, we were doing, um, we were scheduled to play uh, a couple of years back at the Rhythm and Roots Festival in uh, in Rhode Island, and um, Craig was uh, uh, helping out. Uh, he was uh, interviewing artists, you know, for the for the booklet and for the festival and stuff like that. And so, so he interviewed me, and we we, we talked for maybe less than an hour before he said, hey, wait a minute, Max, we need to write a book on you, man. And I was like, okay, well, why not? He goes, would you be interested? I said, sure, why not? You know, I did. and then before he goes, well, let me let me get to see if uh, we have anybody interested uh, as, as far as pub a publisher, you know, give me at least a couple of weeks on it. Well, he called me back two days later. And he said, we have two publishers that are interested. And <laughs> I was like, wow. So uh, that's, uh, you know, that's how I, that's how it all started. Of course, you know, uh, when we got to, do the festival and stuff craig uh, he, he uh, you know he hopped on stage with us and he played and and uh, and then we did some more interviewing and stuff and 
uh, what a fantastic guy, man. It's just uh, so humble and uh, it's, yeah, what can you say? Thank you, Craig. Appreciate, appreciate it. You made a dream come true, man. So thank you. You're quite welcome. It really was a collaboration. Um, Max and I met backstage at the Rhythm and Roots um, and we started talking and I was looking for a new project at th that time. I was actually at that festival for the second year in a row playing with C.J. Chenier and his Zydeco band. Um, I very much loved being on both sides of the stage and my, my ex-wife used to say, if I get cut, musical notes come out. And, and it, I love being immersed in it in every way as a photographer, as a writer, um, as a player. Um, it's, it's all been a lifelong um, experience. The writing, this is actually the 50th anniversary of writing about music. Um, and that's been a wonderful thing. It's, it's enabled me to interview the masters every couple of days of every musical genre and learn right from, from, the, right from the horse's mouth what music is about. I mean, I could, I could listen to Tex-Mex music all day long, but to have Max spend six months almost every day talking about this music from a pers on a personal level, that's what I really love about writing. Uh, the same with the American Indian music book that I just finished. Everybody just telling me their stories. I couldn't get that out of a book or, or out of watching a TV documentary. It's getting to learn the language of music and being fortunate enough to get paid to do it. Uh, it's like going to school with a schol lifelong scholarship. Yeah, so one thing I'm interested in is because we can Google you, Max, right? People can learn a lot about you. So I guess for both of you, my question is, you know, does the book tell us things that go a little bit outside the box in terms of what what we might know about Max already? And for you, Max, like, were there, was through this process of doing the book, were there things that came to you that you hadn't really thought about before? So I guess I'm asking for what might be surprising to us. I see in the room that there are people who are music lovers. So tell us, you know, in some ways, what we might not know about the two of you. Um, well, a, uh, there is, it's not just, the, the book's not just totally uh, Max Baca, Max Baca. Uh, it's, it's, it goes around talking about the, uh, the Tex-Mex uh, music and, and where it came up and where it came from, you know, um, uh, like such as, uh, uh, grow, when I grew, when growing up, you know, I used to, uh, my father was a musician and I used to play with my dad when I was seven years old, I guess, you know, I was his bass player at nine, you know? So, but I never knew what, what, you know, I was just playing music. I was just, you know, listening to what, what he would say, he, you know, I have to play this song and then, you know, whatever. And, but I never knew the, where, it, where the music really came from, but it does explain stuff like, um, you know, uh, Tex-Mex music came from, you know, the Germans that settled in Texas at the turn of the century that, that brought over the button accordion. And then uh, there was some folks uh, back in those days, uh, Narciso Martinez, uh, along with Santiago Jimenez Sr., Flaco Jimenez's father, that were listening to the umpa sounds of the Germans playing it because they, they brought over the accordion, you know, and, and they settled here in Texas. And so um, so when, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that, you know, I was just playing music that I, that I heard that I was listening to on the frontera on the border, you know, and, and from, from the music that came from well, close to, from, from Albuquerque was El Paso from, from Juarez, you know, and that, that kind of Norteño style music, you know, but I didn't know the really, the story behind it. So the book explains, uh, stuff like that and, uh, about Tex-Mex music, uh, about the different artists. You know, uh, it can go from uh, David Hidalgo from Los Lobos to uh, uh, Lyle Lovett. Uh, I believe um, you interviewed Lyle Lovett too, I think. Um, Craig, is that correct? Uh, did you get a no, I, I didn't get to speak to Lyle. Uh, okay. but, but I wound up speaking to so many different people and getting so many different perspectives. Because when we started the project, one of the things that you said 
pointed out is this is not only your story, it's Flacco's story, and it's yeah. Doug Somm's story, and it's Freddie Fender's story. And rather than just talking about the, that little brief time where you were in the Texas tornadoes, it, it's Doug's story from the time he was a child all the way up to that point and until the time that he lost his life um, is important to your journey as well. You can't understand who the importance of Doug Som playing with the Texas Tornadoes if you didn't know this is a Douglas Quintet. Um, and, and you didn't know that he was doing it from the time he was 10 years old. The same with Flacco. Flacco's stories of how he picked up the accordion when his father wasn't looking and started playing. I mean, those are things that we're not talking about a mainstream music where you know everything about it and there's thousands of books. This is a music that is off the radar and despite how wonderful it is, it has been kept off the radar by all the commercial interests. Um, you, you don't hear Tex-Mex music played often anywhere. So to discover it, you have to really be able to know what you're looking at. Um, and, and this book does that. It tells the whole story of what, where the music is and the, the significance of what Max and the, te tex, the Tex Maniacs has done. Um, it isn't just playing music, but there's a whole hundred year history that goes into it. And why do you think, I mean, why would the two of you say, why doesn't it get as much attention? Because where we are here in the Southwest, right? It's in our blood, right? And there are, I don't know of anybody who doesn't know it, but I, I understand what you're saying that maybe elsewhere in the country, um, it's, it's like regional to them. Whereas for people who are, who live here, it's the soundtrack of our lives. It's like any folk or ethnic or world music. It's not mainstream. It's not the lowest common denominator. It's it's Taylor. It's not Taylor Swift um, doing something that's form so formula that it had to that they know down to the quarter notes what it needs for, to make it a hit, and then they throw millions of dollars into the promotion. Um, this is music that's done by people who are authentically, they live the music. And they're not making a zillion money, a million dollars to be able to throw it back into the promotion. I mean, if, they, if Max had the promotion of Britney Spear, he would sell as many records as Britney Spear. The, the fact is, he doesn't. And people... There is wonderful music, but you have to go looking for it. It's not going to be in your face. It's going to be treasures, and there's wonderful treasures out there. And the music that Max has created is one of those treasures. Yeah, it doesn't have the big machine, right? The commercial machine behind it. And yet, right, of such devoted following, I think, of so many people. I mean, it deserves that kind of attention. If they know about it, if if they've somehow come across it or somebody clues them into it, but they're not going to do it by turning on Top 40 radio. They're not going to do it by watching TV and every 10 minutes there's a Tex-Mex or a Native American musician or, or even a Mexican musician. It, it doesn't happen. Um it doesn't happen for any folk music. It doesn't happen. It happens in very rare cases with bluegrass. And for someone in the bluegrass field to do it, they have to cross over into the commercial pop field in order for that success, like Alison Krauss. Mm -hmm. um, to, to keep it authentic and real is going against the commercial forces that that are just doing it for the commercial reasons um, yeah. because because most people don't have we're not talking about 90 uh, <clears throat> we're talking about a society where unfortunately most people aren't geniuses 
and they are lowest con common denominator listeners. That's the bulk of the listeners. This is not lowest common denominator music. This is music that takes a little intelligence and a little bit of open openness. Uh, yeah, so it, what do you, I wonder what the two of you think in terms of like how we encourage that. Is that, I mean, like how do you grab that attention or ideally as you think, you know, what would make the music not more mainstream, but more available? Or is that a catch-22 if they're not paying attention? Yeah. It it's, uh, unfortunately, the, you know, the, the industry, the music industry is nowadays, it's it's all commercialized. It's com commercialized, very commercialized. Just like when you, you watch the Grammys on TV, they're only going to show the, the, the commercialized uh, categories and so forth, you know, and where, where I've been, I've attended the Grammys several times where during the daytime is when they have the the other categories, the folk yeah. categories, the bluegrass categories, the uh, the uh, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, Cajun, the uh, different different uh, country swing, country western, whatever. You know, they only show the on televised because of the commercialized parts aspect of things. Is so, you know, and and unfortunately, um, uh, us guys in the in the uh, in the folk scene because. Tex-Mex conjunto music is is a form of folk music. Yeah. Um, we don't get we don't get the attention like the uh, we don't get the attention like the um, the other commercialized categories, you know. So, um, but to answer your question, to to how would we? That's a good question. How do we how would we uh, get that out there more for the for the mainstream people to to uh, cash in on uh, some some beautiful uh, cultural you know musics you know different. Uh, you know, I, I've I've experienced so many different uh, music around the world. You know, like I remember we did a, we played an accordion festival in Finland, and the there was a, a little girl that was 12 years old, and she was the there was there was a stage full like 50 accordion players on stage, and the little girl was 12 years old, and she was like the the lead soloist, and she was just totally amazing, blew my mind. You know, she just she just played so flawlessly and beautiful and it was like like art you know the, the different accordion players were doing different th sounds you know like yeah like a, like real symphonic you know and and some of the other chord players were doing you know different you know like the, what the violins would do or what the cellos would do and so forth so it was just amazing and then she was just soloing and it was just blew my mind totally amazing uh i've been uh, i you know we were in uh we've been to china and uh, we, we've actually did several several tours in China, and I've got to experience, uh, you know, Mongolian throat singers, you know, and, mm -hmm. and just um, it's amazing, you know, it's amazing how they can make music with their throat, and then they do these octaves, you know, like a, the, the low growl, and then the, the high pitch thing is, is taking the melody, you know, and then the, the, the low, it's it's just it's just amazing to, to see and experience that, and then to get share the stage and collaborate. Was, was such a beautiful thing, man. You know, um, there was different different bands. You know, uh, uh, we've played a festival in China, and it was a, a country music festival they called it. And but it, you would you know you would think country music. You know, you would be going to see Garth Brooks or or, mm -hmm. or a big country a <clears throat> big country artists. You know, and uh, no, it wasn't that. It was music from different countries. You know, so. Uh, we were uh, we were with, through the Smithsonian and the State Department, and in the, in the we were representing music from Texas and in and, uh, and our culture, the, the conjunto, the Tex-Mex thing, you know. And and then there was uh, Mongolian throat singers. There was different uh, people from um, the Middle East, you know, playing the oud. Um, uh, oh, my, one of my good friends, he's from Albuquerque. He's named Rahim. And he plays oud, and uh, and he was there on on this tour with us too. So he he was a really really nice guy and uh, really amazing music, you know. And and so uh, I've got to experience this 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 kind of music, and unfortunately, it doesn't get the attention that you know um, the commercial uh, uh, in the commercial world, you know. Um, so uh, I just you know it's hard to you know you have to kind of promote yourself, you know. It's a self promoting thing, you know, and and. Uh, and unfortunately, like in the Grammys situation, uh, they eliminated in the American Grammys yeah. they eliminated different categories. You know, they don't have the Cajun category. They don't have the the uh, uh, Zydeco category. You know, they kind of come Native American. 
Yeah, native, native. You know exactly the, the Indian, the drum and you know, stuff like that. They don't yeah. um, have. They come combine it all together into one category. Just like the category we were nominated uh, 2019 for an American Grammy with our Cross Crossing the Borders album, Smithsonian Folkways, um, and we got so the, the category they they um, we were in a, it was called regional Mexican. So it's now you have there you have mariachi, banda, tejano. And uh, uh, Mariachi Banda Tejano, and, uh, and and it's another. There's four categories, I think. And, and so they combine all these. And so we're now you're now you're competing with some another whole different you know genre of musics and stuff. So we were up against Luis Miguel, you know, and uh, Mariachi Sol de Mexico and stuff like that. So unfortunately, we we uh, we we lost to Luis Miguel, you know. But uh, uh, but just to be nominated was a was a was an honor, you know, in, in itself. So. But sounds but like we need to advocate or we need to let them know that they shouldn't be lumping everybody yeah. in those categories, right? That they should you have each, 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 each own separate. category. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I listened to that album that won, and it's real syrupy and real plain, straight formula pop. I mean, it, it was a tremendous hit because of that reason, because it was catchy and had the hooks. But it was for someone who appreciates good music, it was barely listenable. Uh, so the interesting thing is that there are different stratas within music. You don't have to be among the pig rich. You don't have to be making a billion dollars to make it justified to be playing music just being able to survive and being able to afford to pay your your way in this world and make a living and get to play music that that is a, a real important thing not everybody has to be so not everybody's a billionaire there are billionaires but being able to be a working musician is, is a good thing and, and it comes from a different place than being just striving for that dollar bill. There's Although it's all, nice not to have to hustle as hard, right, in some ways, so to spread out spread out the wealth in some ways, it certainly spread out the attention. Yeah. Well, you, if you're good, the world gets out there and you, and you wind up playing festivals and you wind up being able to do tours and you wind up being able to keep going um, and surviving, and people pay, pay attention, and you build that audience, and the folk audience is a loyal audience. They're not going to be there for that quick hit, that flash. They're going to be there for years, and they're going to keep coming back, and they're going to bring their friends, and they're going to buy this book, and they're going to buy it, Max's records because there's a genuine connection. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's true. That's why live performances are so important, right? I think. Yes, absolutely. And you know, that's the thing. You know, as, as you grow up, um, you're, you're climbing that ladder. What they say, you're climbing the ladder. You know, and uh, and you're trying to uh, you know make it in, in in what you're doing. You know, and and it's like, um, yeah, you know, we got to we get it to a point to where okay, now when we go. You know, we do a tour. Say we go to Ohio, um, and we uh, will, you know, sell out of a theater in Ohio because there's fans that that love that kind of music and that yeah. they follow us or whatever. And you have a, a true fan, you know. Um, where nowadays you can you can go on Facebook and buy yeah. likes and and stuff like that, you know. And this is um, something that we that we take our pride in what we do and and um, you know, and work hard, you know, to, to climb that ladder, you know, and, and, and just, uh, uh, you know, try to get better gigs and try to, to keep, keep the band working, you know, cause this is what we do for a living. And, um, and it's like, you know, we don't, we don't want to be a millionaire. I mean, who, I mean, yeah, I mean, who does, wouldn't want to be, but theoretically, I mean, we just want to work, you know, want to work and keep, you know, pay the mortgage and, 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 and that kind of stuff, you know? And, um, so, you know, that's 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 what it's about you know and, and the because every one of them fans that you have 
they're going to be a true fan and they're going to every time you have a, a, a cd out or a new release or something they're going to buy it or they're going to if you're yeah. in, their, in their in their city and you're doing a show or a concert they're going to attend to it you know um that's why i really admire los lobos uh because they're they've been around for you know the same guys in the same band for over 45 years yeah. and um and every time they 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 you know they go play in a in a city or whatever they sell it they sell it out because they're so consistent and and that they're true uh, uh, music uh, that they do and and the, the fans are true to them you know um, and and it's like there's a lot of what they, what we would call one hit wonders I guess you you know and yeah. and they pack it in you know pack in the the, the the coliseum man you know sell it out or whatever but then five years later that's it. You know, yeah, yeah that's it yeah you know but um these are these are musicians that stay true to what do they do in their their culture and 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 people want to experience that you know and 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 they want to they go and taste that you know and, and hear what they what they have to offer and and i'm a, i mean i'm a huge lobos fan they're they're my heroes man you know i love those guys man um and and, and bands i i like bands that 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 feel from the heart you know when they're performing and not so much you know nowadays you go to a concert and it's they're just playing the cd really you know and they're they're, they're playing a cd and 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 lip singing you know and running up back and forth from st on stage or whatever in the in the show and stuff like that and but that's cool you know there's people that like that you know but me personally um you know, everybody has an opinion you know some people like coke some people like pepsi you know mm. but i i i like uh the true musician that can actually play his instrument and, and make that instrument talk you know um, whether it's a guitar or whether it's a, a, a violin uh, what a, a cello whatever um, just the, the, the true musician you know that you you know you can sit down and just feel what they're feeling you know that that's what that's what that's what I'm about that's what I like you know um, and then it's some you know, then you turn on the radio and all you're gonna hear is commercial music you know and uh, but you rarely hear that true you know, the BB King, you know, went playing his guitar, you know, or or the Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, you know, kind of thing, you know. It's 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 very rare that you know that that our music that that music gets commercialized, you know, and um, it's just uh, one of those things, I guess, uh, you know. So I have a I'm after I know that Craig, I, I you want to play a little clip, so I'm going to let you do that, and I do have a question about the accordion and the bajo sexto that I'll ask mm -hmm. after that because I. Sure. saw you in a video talk about the relationship and I loved it. But I think Craig, can you, do you want to play us a clip? I can do that. I just uh, real quick want to say hello to Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs>
primavera fría Te acercaste a mí Y con un dulce beso me enamoré de ti Eres bonita como las flores Y yo te adoro sin condiciones Tus ojos brillan como luceros Eres mi amor como te quiero Would you talk about that? I won't say what I saw, but um, you know that relationship between those two instruments is the thing about conjunto. It's not that the other, the drummer isn't, you know, they aren't important. But would you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. The um, if you notice on that video, uh, the accordion. <clears throat> my, that's my little nephew, uh, Josh Baca. He's from Albuquerque, and that's uh, his my his my brother. That's his son. So. Um, uh, the accordion, if you notice that he had the uh, the New Mexico uh, Zia, the New Mexico flag accordion, pretty much but on the flag, New Mexico flag, and he had the Z symbol, and then it was all yellow, and then the red straps and all that. But uh, uh, we per per personalized that accordion, especially for him, and we surprised him on, on Christmas with that um, from Aww. Honer. Um, so anyhow, uh, the, the accordion um, and and the bajo sexto, they're um, they're like brothers because. Um, when we um, heard the when we heard the sounds from the, the Germans, right? Uh, uh, we started picking up an accordion. So, when if you notice when the Germans play, they would accompany them themselves. You know, they have the the, the, the right hand side of the uh, the accordion uh, is where they where they play the leads. You know, and then the left hand side is the accompaniment part. So, uh, back in those days, the, the, we were hearing that and we started playing. And so we wanted something to to kind of take the place of that accompaniment sound you know so um so that's when they came up with a, a bajo sexto and the bajo sexto of course is from from uh, the started in the middle guitar any guitar started from the middle east and worked its way you know to spain and then to into the into the america whatever but uh the uh, the bajo sexto was kind of like uh, uh they, they wanted that they wanted that sound you know to to accompaniment an accordion player so um the bajo sexto comes from uh from Michoacán, um, from Paracho, Paracho, digo, Paracho, Mexico, Michoacán, and um, and so uh, there was a guitar, uh, a luthier in in um, in Michoacán, and um, nobody doesn't remember his name, but he actually showed a gentleman uh, back in those days how to make a bajo sexto. Martin Macias was the the, the maker for a bajo sexto, and. Uh, and so uh, Lydia Mendoza played, she played a, a, a guitarra doble, which is a, a double string guitar, but it's not like the a 12, string, 12 string guitar that you've seen in the stores nowadays, which has the little thinner gauge strings. These were thicker gauge strings, like Lead Belly played one, hmm. you know, he played that, uh, the uh, the national, the, 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 the Lead Belly played the, the, the guitarra doble kind of thing, you know, the 12 string with the bigger strings. So, but it still wasn't quite like, that tuba sound, you know, that honky billy tuba sound. So they added some thicker strings to it, to the low end and a high and a low octave. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how they got that, 
okay, now we now we're really close to the to the sound on this accompaniment sound. So they uh, Martin Macio was credited for for making for making the uh, bajo sextos, and then this was uh, and then he migrated at the turn of the century. He migrated to San Antonio and started making them out of San Antonio. You know, at a furniture store, and so so now when you add the bajo sexto with the accordion, that allows the accordion players to play faster because keep in mind if they're playing in, in and out you know uh, you know in a, in a diatonic accordion you know um where like a piano accordion is a chromatic accordion because it has the same sound when you push and you pull so that's a, a, a chromatic accordion the three roll accordions button accordions are uh, diatonic so it's like having uh three harmonicas in three different keys so you have um a G, a C, and an F harmonica, right? So mm-hmm. each sound is going to be different when you push and you blow in and blow out. It's going to be, you know, different sound. So that's what the diatonic accordion is, and 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 so the and the left hand side is the accompaniment part, you know, the bass note, what they call the bass notes. So if you get a, an, a, an accordion and you press, push one of the buttons in and out, there's going to be a, a, a kind of a, a, a rhythm sound more or an orchestrated sound and then there's going to be a, a low note a low bass note sound um chang um chang um chang you know, kind of that sound so when they created the bajo sexto they, they were trying to get that sound you know similar to that mm. and so now when they now when they have now that they have uh, the bajo the the accompaniment so now that created that's where we created our own our own sound now because it's different now. It's it's got a whole different, you know, uh, whole different sounds, you know, and uh, and so it allowed the accordion players to play faster, you know, uh, flashier or whatever, and and uh, concentrate more on that on just the melodies and so much the accompaniment, you know. So the accompaniment guy guys just doing the accompaniment part. So that's where we created our our sound, tech, and then we called it Tex Mex, you know, because the text the accordion is from came from Texas, you know, from the Germans, you know, from that said, brought, brought over the accordion, uh, the button accordion, you know, and then the Mex, Mexican guitar, you know, from Michoacan to Mex. So that's Tex-Mex. That's where they came came up with that Tex-Mex. Uh, I love that because that just really spoken like a true musician allows us to kind of cl- climb in there when we're listening to the music, but also makes me think about how the the amazing thing about conjunto, like many forms of music, is all those influences. I mean, you mentioned Rahim, right? And as soon as you mentioned that, I could sort of hear it. Or when you said they were trying to get this sound that almost like thought in their heads, right? To try to get the mm. to, to to create. And I mean, I just think that that's how music works. And it- oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's really just rich and interesting. And, and for me, it makes listening to the music that much more exciting because you've kind of teased out these elements that um you know that you start to listen to and i think that's what makes music even more interesting even if you're a long time listener right it's just having musicians talk about what you just said which is really pretty cool so i know we want to get to everybody's questions in, in right now i think 